Okay, good morning. We thank uh, Devora and Avi Orlan for sponsoring again in memory of their beloved daughter, Mary Master Bas Avram Yitzchak. Our learning and uh, increase in growth in Amuna should be Le'ili Nishmasa, should elevate her beautiful soul. Okay, we're starting a new limud today, starting something new. It's uh, also from Revolbi, from the second volume of Ali Shor, of his uh, monumental work of personal growth of Musr, the great Mashkiach of Yushalayim. And this is Marachas Avoda Hamusaris. Hamusaris. It's the 18th chapter, and the chapter title is Birchas Anenin. And we're going to study a little bit about brachos, making brachos. We make a, we're supposed to make a hundred of them a day. We might as well understand a little bit more what we're doing, why we're doing, and derive the benefit of what making all those brachas every day is supposed to bring or yield to our lives. Okay? Everyone got it? The cover? See where we are? Page Shin Yadalad. The Gemara Menachos Mem Gimel says in the name of Rabbi Meir that a person is obligated to recite a hundred brachas every day. We've said this before. And where do we learn this from that we're supposed to recite a hundred brachas every day? Because the Torah says, Yisrael. And now, Jewish people, what does God want from you after all? What does He want from you? What's the big deal? And what's the answer? What does Hashem want from us? Ki'im li'ir'ah. He wants us to have awe, not fear, but as we've translated several times, He wants us to live with a sense of awe, a sense of mindfulness of His presence in our life, a sense of appreciation of the gifts and the goodness that He bestows upon us. That's all He wants from us. That's all He wants from us. This is an amazing passage. The Gemara, in fact, entertains, is that really such a small thing? The Chizim Milsa Zutrasa is such a small matter the Gemara says, yeah, for Moshe, it's a very small matter. Living with a sense of Yerush living with a sense of mindfulness or consciousness that Hashem is always in our lives, for Moshe is, in fact, a very small matter. And that's why Moshe is able to so casually and comfortably say, that's all he wants from us. That's all he wants from us. There's another Medrash which says that later, David HaMelech says to Hashem, what do I want from you? Acha shalti. There's only one thing I want from you. What do I want from you? Acha shalti meis Hashem, Moshe avakish, shivti beveis Hashem, koyim echayai, lachos benom Hashem, ulevaker beichalo. And then he lists three things. I thought, acha shalti, what happened? I only want one thing. So God calls him out and says, David, acha shalti, you said you only want one thing. And then you proceed to list three things. So David says, Hashem, with all due respect, I learned from the best. I learned from you. You said, ma Hashem, lo kecha shom eimach, what does God want from you? And we only quote the beginning of the pasuk, ki im liyirah, I want to fear and so on and to walk humbly with Hashem. And then, God, you went on to list a whole list. So I learned the same move. You say one thing and then you go on to list a whole list. So anyway, the Gemara here, Rameir derives from this Pasuk, Ma Hashem Lokacha. Don't read it Ma Mem Hey, but read it Mea, Mem Aleph Hey. What does Hashem want from you? Mea. A hundred times a day he wants you to remember him. By the way, the Chavetz Chaim reinterprets also this Pasuk, even before we're beginning, Revolve this piece here. The Chavetz Chaim in the Sefer Avos HaChesed interprets, you know what Hashem wants from you? What He wants is Viata. Did I say this before? No. Viata Yisrael, Mashem Lekech HaShom Eimach. The usual way to read, read the Pasuk is, and now Jewish people, what does God want from you? But the Chavetz Chaim says, don't read it that way. Read it. Mashem Shaol Meimach. What does God want from you? Viata. He wants you to not procrastinate, to not be lazy, to not push off. He wants you Viata. Now, to be present, to be mindful. He wants you to do now what you're meant to be doing now. Don't wait, don't delay, don't push off. He wants you to live with a very, very intense sense of viata. Be doing now what you're meant to be doing now. Live with a sense of viata. So what is it that God wants from you? He wants you to live a life of viata. He wants you to never procrastinate. Don't be lazy, don't push off, don't delay. Don't say when I get to it, when I have time, viata. Don't wait, do it now. Anyway, now to Revolbi. So from this Pasuk, where he says, what does God want from us? Where do we derive this obligation to say a hundred brachas a day? We derive it from the Pasuk that says, all God wants from you is to live with a sense of awe of here. So if that's all God wants from us, it tells us that the tachlis of our creation, the purpose of our existence, the mission and the goal of every day is yira, to live with a sense of awe. And in fact, that is the essence of all the mitzvos together. At the core of all the mitzvos, 
I'm going to speak about probably on Shabbos. It's very unusual on a Wednesday. I know what I'm going to speak about on Shabbos. <laughs> but I happen to see this also from Ravolbi. I saw this yesterday. He quotes Rav Sadjigon who says that all 613 mitzvos are contained in the Aseris Adibros. The Aseris Adibros, the Ten Commandments of our Parsha, are really a headline for all of mitzvos. And then all the Ten Commandments are really included in the First Commandment. And all the First Commandment is really included in the opening word. So Rav Sadjigon says you can summarize the entire totality of Torah. All of mitzvos and halacha and obligations are all contained in the word Anochi. How is that? I. Anochi Hashem Lekach. I am the Lord your God. I. Anochi. How is all of Torah captured in Anochi? Well, if you understand, it means to live with a sense of awe and acknowledgement of Hashem's presence. Yira Shamayim. Yira Hashem. All of mitzvos. So Rav Obihir also is writing that the purpose, the essence of all mitzvos, everything I do, Ben Adon Lamakom, Ben Adon I'm trying to feel his presence in my life. I'm trying to see him. And I'm trying to pursue and carry out his mission. I'm trying to accomplish his mission. And there's a lot of work for us to do to repair the world and bring light in his vision and to do his mission. It's a terrible article. Today's New York Times. It talks about uh, Michael Cohn. Is that his name? The yes. president? Yes. So he's in jail in Otisville. And a lot of Jews like to joke, oh, Otisville, there's several dafyomis and there's minyanim and there's kosher food. And the whole article is an enormous chil Hashem that talks about those dafyomis and kosher and tzitzis and, and Otisville and the, and the bar mitzvahs and the simchas and all oh, this, this from jail that has so many from criminals. And it's just a terrible, terrible chil Hashem. I'm not talking about any of the particular individuals for which we should have sympathy and love and try to support them and so on and so forth. I'm not talking about the people that references who are there, but the whole phenomenon that a newspaper, that's uh, all the news, it's fit yeah, to print, but this international newspaper, has, that it makes headlines, that there's a whole story, how observant Torah Jews are in this, uh, are, are incarcerated in prison. It's such a chil Hashem, it just, it just reminds us of our mission to have to do the opposite, to create a kiddush Hashem, to bring greater light into this world. So the purpose of all mitzvos is to reveal Hashem in this world. How do we do it? So how do we do it? Certainly there are mitzvahs. I begin my day with davening. I end my day with davening. But what about in between? How am I sure to remember that there's a God in between? I'm at work. I'm on the gym. I just came back from the supermarket. I'm taking care of my tasks, my to-do list. I'm pursuing my professional career. I'm raising my children. Whatever I'm doing during my day is filled with distractions. It's filled with interruptions. So yeah, I began my day with davening. And then min chamarav, I end my day with davening. But what about in between? How do I remember that I answer to a higher power? How do I remember that I have a greater responsibility? How do I remember my mission to bring light and to repair this world? How do I remember the tachlis of my existence? The essence and purpose and goal of why I'm here is to establish a relationship with Hashem. How do I remember He's there to overcome my anxiety, my worry, my fear, my envy, my jealousy, my anger? So the answer Chazal said is very simple. A hundred times a day, interrupt your day and make brachos. You know how you remember? Because other people like to eat on the run. Other people snack as they go. Other people, food, eating is mindless. For a Jew, every time you eat, you're going to make a bracha before, you're going to make it a bracha after. For others, you find time, you steal time to go to the bathroom. You run to the bathroom, you run out of the bathroom. bathroom. For a Jew, you come out of the bathroom, you're making a bracha. A hundred times a day, you're going to interrupt your day when other people would be totally remiss, would be distracted a hundred times a day. We interrupt our day to say, oh, I'm going to enjoy this apple. I just got out of the bathroom and everything worked right. Oh, I'm going to acknowledge and thank and work on and reveal Hashem. So the question is how? It says Revolba, how do brachos promote? How are they a platform for growing our sense of awe of Hashem? Every bracha we recite, this is a halacha comment, Every bracha we recite has to include Hashem's name. Baracha ta Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Ha'olam. Every bracha includes both God's name and references God's monarchy, that God is the king, He's Malchus. Afilum dileg rak al tevas ha'olam tzorach lach zor. The Shulchan Aruch Ha'orachayim Simen Reish Yadalad says, if you say a bracha but you omit the word ha'olam. So you said, Baracha ta Hashem, Elokeinu Melech, and you forgot the word ha'olam. Shulchan Aruch says, you got to go back and repeat it. Because you called God a king, but if you left out the world, then what's he the king of? A king who has no world is Nishken king. He's not a king. You have to have a world. You have to have servants. You have to have subjects to be a king. 
So if you say God's the king, but you don't mention he has subjects, if you say he has subjects, you didn't mention he's the king, if you omit any part of that first template of a bracha, bracha ta'ashem alukeinu melacha olam it's you have to go back and repeat the bracha. Why? The answer is because every bracha begins with the acknowledgement there is a king and I am his subject. I don't run the world. I'm not responsible. I don't shape reality. I do my best. I take initiative. I participate. I do what's meant for me to do. I have to work on what I have to work on. But in the end of the day, I concede and I submit. He's the king and I am his subject. He is in charge and I accept whatever he determines. So that's the beginning of every single bracha. This apple, I bought it at Publix or Winn-Dixie or wherever I bought it, but really it's from Hashem. He's the king and he willed this apple into existence. And without God's consent, his support, his permission, there wouldn't be this delicious apple. The tree wouldn't have taken root or it would have been overcome with words, worms, or the apple would have spoiled and become rot or it'd be sour instead of sweet. Or there's a million thoughts I can have about the apple. Now, thinking of those thoughts is not debilitating before I eat the apple. It's, actual, it's actually the greatest act of mindfulness. If you've ever read about or tried to engage mindful eating, it's all about being fully present and, and savoring and extracting everything. So instead of mindlessly eating an apple on the go while you're talking to somebody and answering an email and responding to a text and listening to the radio and doing 17 other things, and then you don't even re- and driving all at the same time, and you don't even realize you ate the apple. So you're left holding a core, not sure what to do with it. You don't even realize you ate the apple. Mindful eating says, note the texture. And note whether it's hard or soft, whether it's ripe or whether it's unripened. Is it sweet? Is it sour? How does it taste on the tongues, the different parts of the tongue and on your palate? And did you fully chew it? So when you swallow it, are you chewing something which is chewed? And did your nose take in the aroma of the apple at the same time that you were tasting it on your tongue? All of that changes the experience of eating the apple. How do you get your mind to a place of all of that? A bracha. Because if you want to say, Hashem, wow, thank you for the texture and the taste and the aroma, the ability to chew and to swallow and to digest and to eliminate. Wow, this apple has now just gone from eating an apple, it's now gone from a moment of eating a snack to a moment of an exercise of deep faith, to a miraculous experience of the gift of an incredible apple. So if you skip the words Melech Olam, if you skip the beginning, the template of all brachos, then you've undermined the purpose of a bracha because the purpose of a bracha is to connect what you're about to do with the fact that God is the king of the universe. So whether it's before you're doing something like eating or after you've eaten or after you've gone to the bathroom or before you're smelling a pleasant fragrance or aroma, you know, before you smell, smell spices, the bracha Borei Minei Vesamim or Borei Atzei Vesamim is not just a bracha for Saturday night. Many people mistakenly think that's a bracha that's part of Havdalah. It happens to be we smell those things during Havdalah, which necessitates or demands making that bracha. But if on a Sunday through Friday you also smell besamim, you also make a bracha. It's part of the Birch and It's a bracha you're making on something that you enjoy. So whatever bracha we're reciting begins with melech olam. I'm going to wash my hands or put on my tzitzis or light the candles or whatever mitzvah I'm about to do that incorporates a bracha to it. I'm hanging a mezuzah. Whatever mitzvah I'm about to do, shekidoshanam mezuzah, Melech HaOlam. Blessed are you, God, the King of the Universe. What I'm about to do is connecting to me to you, King of the Universe. I'm putting a mezuzah up so that when I walk through the threshold of this home, this room, I remember there's a King of the Universe who's aware of everything that goes in on. That the values of this home will be dictated by the fact that you are the King of the Universe. Whatever mitzvah, whatever bircha sanenu, whatever bircha sashevach, whatever I'm doing is connected to those words, Melech HaOlam. Umamshichem borei peri. Now, speaking about Birchas Anan in particular, which is Revolba's topic, I'm making a bracha on something I'm about to enjoy. So I'm making a bore priha eitz. I'm going to enjoy a geschmack apple. God, Baruch Ata Hashem, Baruch comes from the word brecha, a flow. God, all blessing flows from you. The word Baruch is not God, I'm giving you a bracha. I can't give God a bracha. Sometimes my little children, my little son, I give him a bracha Friday night. He says, okay, Abba, now I give you a bracha. He puts his hands on my head. Blah, 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 blah. And he gives you a bracha, right? It's cute. It's adorable. I give you a bracha. I'm the, I'm the Abba. Now you give me a bracha. It's cute. It's adorable. It's sweet. 
So is that what we're doing? We say, Hashem, oh, Hashem, you give us such bracha, now I'm going to give you a bracha. Baruch atah Hashem, okay. Hashem zusui, now I put my hands on your kepi, I give you a bracha. Of course not, it's ridiculous, the thought of our giving Hashem a bracha. So what does Baruch atah Hashem mean? Baruch means, milosh and brecha, it means, God, I'm acknowledging that you are the makor bracha. You are the source of all blessing. Baruch atah Hashem. God, you are blessed means not, God, I'm giving you a bracha for good parnasa, gezunt, nachas, I'm not giving Hashem a bracha. Hashem, you are blessed means you are the source of all blessing. Whatever blessing is in my life, whatever I'm enjoying, the roof over my head, the car I drive, my family, my clothing, success in business, a good workout, a delicious meal, whatever I've just taken in, my vacation week, my family time, whatever blessing is in my life, mekor bracha, baruch atah Hashem, you are the source of that bracha. That's what the word baruch means. Not I'm blessing God, but I'm seeing God as the source of blessing. So then when I conclude, so that's the template, that's the opening of every bracha, it's the formula. Then each bracha has a distinct ending. So when I eat an apple, it's bore peri, I ate. Right? One of my daughters, as a, the nine-year-old, had a bracha, it's not a bracha, kanta, a bracha test. Thick, it's not a bracha bee, it's a thick packet bracha test. So all day long, you're just uh, mentioning foods, all the trick foods, the peanut, the banana, the, the, the crispix, the, you're going through all the trick foods, right? So, brachas, brachas, brachas. Each one has a different ending, which is annoying. Why can't there just be one generic bracha on everything? But each one has a distinct ending. So, borei pri, umachzikim b'zeh sa'emuna sh'kash baruchu borei olam chodov prati shebo. Why is each thing a distinct ending? Because I'm giving God a distinct acknowledgement that he made the apples, and he made the vegetables in the ground. And he made the drink, and he made the meat and the chicken. He's made everything. Says Ravo, but Chazal were making us a promise and prediction. Chazal were telling us the following. Somebody who does not zorek mipiv. Zorek mipiv means casually throw out of their mouth. Meaning somebody who doesn't just offer lip service to a bracha, but is actually present when they say the bracha, bezbonanus. Somebody's mindful and present and concentrates and thinks about the bracha they're saying. And if you do that a hundred times a day, guess what? You'll be a Yuri Shemayim at the end of the day. If you a hundred times a day make the effort to be mindful and present when you make a bracha, Chazal's promise is you will be mindful. You will be a Yuri Shemayim at the end of the day. It's like saying, if you do 100 push-ups a day, 100 sit-ups a day, you're going to be healthy. Go to the gym 100 times a day. Think 100 times a day about what you're eating or drinking. Here's my promise, you're going to be healthy. So what's true physically is also true spiritually. If 100 times a day physically I remain mindful and present of what I'm eating and did I do my sit-ups and push-ups and did I hit my 10,000 steps for the day, I'm going to be physically healthy. Well, if 100 times a day I interrupt my day to say, ah, Baruch, all bracha comes from you. Melech, you're the king ha'olam, I am your subject. And this apple... Or that going to the bathroom, or the mezuzah I just hung, or that filling I just put on, it's all connecting me to you, the king, then at the result of doing that a hundred times a day, I'm going to be a Yerei Shemayim. But what's the key to it working? He's quoting the Gemara, Baruchos Mem Zayin. Revolba says, the first step to success is that you have to do it for real. You could do real push-ups, or you could do fake push-ups. You could be doing the, working the, the weights hard or you could be you know, cheating a little bit here and there. Not going up all the way or down all the way or putting all the weight on. So you're zorek mipiv. Is it better to say a bracha without thinking about it than not say it at all? Absolutely. But it's best and it fulfills, it accomplishes most its goal when it's don't be his bodidus. person has to be mindful. You have to be present. You have to think about baruch, melech, haolam, borei, peri, haetz. Time yourself. You know what the difference is between Zorik Mipiv, dismissing casually a bracha, lip service, versus concentrating? We're talking a second or two. You're talking a couple seconds. You're not talking about the difference of, should I spend an hour on the bracha or a millisecond? It's not an enormous sacrifice or adjustment in your life. We're talking about a few seconds, but here's the thing. The accumulation of those few seconds leads to, at the end of the day, you're a Yerei Shemayim. So if you aspire to Yerei Shemayim, or if you aspire for your children or grandchildren to have Yira Shemayim, do they hear us ever make a bracha? If they hear us make a bracha, do they hear us make it in a manner that Zorik Mipiv, it's lip service? Or do they see us say, hold on one second, I have to make a bracha. Baruch, Ata, Shem. Okay, Melech, Olam, Borei, Prihaitz. Take a bite of the apple. Okay, I'm sorry, what were you saying? 
Your kid's going to look at you and go, whoa, wow, what was that? Well, I was thinking about Melech and Olam, and wow, that's unbelievable. What do they see us do? Kedarkenu tafasta merubalo tafasta, tafasta mu'a tafasta. You know, we have a principle. If you take on too much, you won't take on anything. But if you do it little by little, you'll accomplish. So this is Vad Rishon. This whole Sefer, Alei Shur, Revoba didn't get up in front of a packed audience and give these as shiurim, and Revoba didn't write this to disseminate these as articles or essays. These are notes from Vadim. Revoba had a group of people he met with, and they were working together on things. A Vad is a group who can feel vulnerable to one another, who are con- who can confide in one another, and who together are pledging to be working and growing on, on certain efforts together. So this was the first Vad. The whole first Vad was that. This Gemara in, Brach, this Gemara in Menachos, Reb Meir, don't read it, Mahashem Elkecha, but Meya, a hundred times a day, that the Halacha, if you leave out one of the words in the beginning of the Baracha, you have to repeat it again because this formula is the template to Yerush Shemayim, that you shouldn't be Zorik Mipiv. And there, he, then he gave a homework assignment. I'm not going to end the share here, although we could, if we were following Revolba's timetable. But he ended his Vad, and he gave homework to all the participants, the members of the Vad. And he said, here's the deal. Choose a Bracha, and be present and mindful in that Bracha. Work on it for a few weeks, and then we'll add to it. And then we'll grow from there. Then we'll grow from there. So decide Shahako, Hamotzi, Alamechia, Benching. A good one is Asher Yatzar. Asher Yatzar. We've mentioned this before, but I know a group of guys who are working on not walking around when they say Asher Yatzar. Standing still to say Asher Yatzar. I'm not a sheer smile. Somebody, who's the one who said Asher Yatzar is not Tfilas Haderach? You don't say Asher Yatzar while you're walking away. Stand still. It is a world of difference if you stand still to say Asher Yatzar versus if you say it while you're walking and going to where you were going. So whatever you want to take on, shahakol, asher yatzar, ala mechia, benching, don't take on hanging a mezuzah because you don't do that often enough. But whatever you're taking on, decide, here's my bracha. I'm going to acquire, I'm going to master this bracha. I'm not tafasta merubalo tafasta. I'm not going to say, you know what, for the rest of my life, every bracha I say, I'm going to say with full. You're never going to do it. And so what happens is, when you fail to do it, you're just going to give up and abandon the whole aspiration to begin with. So instead say, this is my bracha. Shahakol, alamecha, whatever the whatever the bracha is, that's my bracha, and that bracha, and that bracha alone to begin with, I'm pledging, I'm making a commitment, I'm going to remind myself, I'm going to tell the people around me to hold me accountable to that bracha. Say Baruch Hashem is the source of all bracha, makor bracha. Ata you, wow, I have a casual relationship. I could talk to God in the first person. You, Hashem Elokeinu, you're my God. You're not just the abstract God. Elokeinu, you're my God. You have a relationship with me. You care about me. You're invested in me. Melech, you're the king of the whole universe. Haolam, I am your subject. If you're the king, then it matters. It means something that I'm your subject. Bore, you are the creator. Not in the past, but in the present. You continue to will creation. Pri, the delicious fruit. Look at the texture. Look at the taste. Look at the appearance. Smell the aroma. Ha'et, ha'adama, and so on and so forth. Take on a bracha. You're adding milliseconds. Nothing, nothing. If you do it the right way versus the wrong way. If you stand still versus saying it while walking. You're adding milliseconds in terms of the loss of time. But what qualitatively you're adding to your life in terms of your presence and your relationship with Hashem, it's a game changer. At the end of the day, it's transformative. You will be a different person. It is a game changer. And therefore, it's something to work on. And here's the thing. It's not just a game changer for you. The whole environment, the whole culture, the whole climate. This is what Revolva is going to get to here. About Bir Chasanen, and don't just impact the person saying it. But Bir Chasanen and changes. It has cosmic implications and effects. It changes the universe. The whole world feels the reverberations of when we make a bracha. When I bring Hashem down to this world, when I give Him a dira b'tachtonim, when I give Him a presence here in the lower world through the apple, the orange, through the steak or the potatoes, through the sandwich or through whatever it is, the milkshake, the coffee, the water, the scotch, whatever I'm enjoying, when I give Hashem presence, dira b'tachtonim, when I bring Him down to this world, I'm not just impacting myself. It's not just my yir Hashem, or my relationship with Hashem, but I have the reverberations, the impact of what I'm doing can be felt all around me. That's practical. My children or grandchildren hear me say a bracha and hear me not just casually lip service bracha, but really say a bracha, they're going to be different too. My whole home is going to be different. My environment's going to be different. Now, it's not always easy to do this. There are people who are at work all day 
How do you make a bracha? You come out of the bathroom at work and you're standing in the hallway and people are walking by, you're going to say an Asher Yatza there? Yeah. Not so simple. Not so easy. So first of all, you don't have to say the Asher Yatza right outside the bathroom. Find a private spot. Find a cubicle or a corner. Close the door of your office. And say it with kavana. Take those few steps till you find the place. Don't forget that you have to say the Asher Yatza. Don't start looking at your phone or answering your text or walking into a, into a colleague. But the point is, it's not always easy, and I don't mean to minimize that when you're at work and you're having lunch with colleagues or you're at lunch, that you can just easily make a bracha. But I will say this, as somebody who has the luxury of working in an environment where it's no problem to make brachas, but I will say this. We are living in a world today where I think maybe it's easier than ever to unapologetically make that bracha. And what would the world look like if you at lunch, as a normal person, not a fanatic, radical, trying to proselytize, but say to the person, excuse me for one second, I say a blessing over food, and say the blessing. Do you think the person will look down at you or up at you? Do you person will think less or more of you? I think we're living in a world where at worst they'll be like, okay, that's weird, I don't know what this person's all about, at worst. But at best they're going to say, wow, that's amazing, tell me more about that. Well, just like I don't steal food, I pay for it. I believe that God created the food in this world and I want to take a moment to thank Him and to, to see His presence. You think, you, you think even your atheist colleague is going to think less of you? So I think that we should have the courage to be unapologetic. Because if you look around the cafeteria at work, the Muslim and the Christian and the Hindu and the Buddhist and the Indian, uh, everyone else is making their blessing, lying down, saying their prayer, wearing their religious paraphernalia, doing what they need to do unapologetically with no defensiveness and no worry. And good for them, they should. And so should we. So we shouldn't hesitate to make that Asher Yatzar. Okay, you want to find a discreet place, find a discreet location. But the bracha and so on and so forth that we're doing, I think the world will look more at us and not less. Vad Hashem, let's begin the second paragraph. Yir HaShamayim Eina Mitztam Mitztam Tzemes Liz Yachsus HaOdom El Baro Him Mishane Es Kol HaMabat HaOlam Yir HaShamayim, the notion, again, why are we making a hundred brachas a day? Ma HaShem Elokecha don't read it, ma, read it, meya. What's the tachlis? What's the purpose? What's the reason that we're making these hundred brachos? So at the end of the day, we have improved. We transformed ourselves as yirei shemaim. We're living in the sense of awe of God. We're cal- calibrating our awe of God compass. And why are we doing that? It's not just about my relationship with God. It's about an entirely different worldview, says Ravolbi. Now let's delve into the depth of the idea of making brachos. The Talmud Yerushalmi in the sixth chapter says the following. God owns the whole world and everything in it. And if you benefit from God's world because He owns it, if you take something that belongs to me without permission, you are a, you're a thief, you're a ganav. Well, just like everything in my home belongs to me, and you're not entitled to just walk in and to use it. I was at a wedding on Sunday, and at the chassan's tish, somebody had an iPhone charger plugged into the wall with no phone on the end of it. And my battery was almost dead. So I was debating in my mind, Am I allowed to plug my phone into the charger without permission? It's an interesting halacha question. Maybe it falls into the area of zenen of his elochasar. I'll benefit. It doesn't cost that other person. I'm not consuming a product of theirs that will be at a loss. There's no wear and tear on that cord from the fact that I plugged it into my iPhone. So am I allowed to use someone's property without their permission? If somebody has a pen lying around, can I use their pen? If somebody's talis and tefillin, I don't have talis. If someone has a sitter, can I use their sitter? So, Allah HaMishnabura differentiates between a religious article and a non-religious article because the assumption of a religious article is that people would be okay with you using their religious article because they want to promote religious observance. Whereas if it's their personal device or object, they would be less okay. So you can't work off the assumption that they have no problem with your, their, your using their object. So I was debating at this chassan's tish, what was the status of this cord? What's my point? You can't use someone's stuff without asking permission. Everything in your home is presumed to belong to you. And even if I'm a guest in your home, just because I'm a guest in your home doesn't mean I can start taking your things unless you give me permission. Well, guess what? We're all guests in God's home. This world, Lashem Haaratzum La'a, this whole world is God's home. And we are guests here. We pay rent, but we're guests here. And as guests, we're not entitled to just take what we want. We need to ask permission. And what is the formula for which we ask permission? A bracha. A bracha. 
So the Pnei Moshe, one of the commentaries on the Yerushalmi says, Ad yasiru la mitzvahs klomar, ad shi yivarech, vaaz husru lo lehanos min ha-mitzvah sheyna arzum la-ash, nechshavin kamom mitzvahs. So what does it mean that if you benefit from this world, you are ma'al, you are, how do you translate ma'al? You're, you're desecrating, you're, you're stealing, you're a thief. But mi'ila is a very particular connotation. Mi'ila is when you have consecrated property in the temple and a person uses it for personal benefit, they violated mi'ila. So if you have a bench which is dedicated, it's consecrated for the temple and you sit on it for your own personal benefit, you eat consecrated foods, you wear consecrated clothing, if you use items, stuff that has been consecrated, that is sacred to the temple, and you use it for personal benefit, you violate mi'ila. So it's not, it's not um, coincidental that our rabbis use that language, that if you use the objects of this world casually without asking permission, you should view them as consecrated property that you used personally, and you violated mi'ila. And what grants permission to use them? What makes it okay? What gives us license? Until the mitzvos make it permissible. So the Pnei Moshe says, what do you mean the mitzvos? It should say, till you recite a bracha. So the Pnei Moshe says, which mitzvah is it in particular that makes it permissible to use? Making a bracha. bracha. The whole world is like a vineyard, and how do we redeem the vineyard? Through a bracha. So what's the difference between the two models? The Yerushalmi here is quoting two different sort of metaphors for what the experience of making a bracha before we eat. The first metaphor is, it's like me'ila, consecrated property, that if you don't redeem it, you're violated me'ila. And the second example is, it's like a kerem, that you have to redeem it, you have to do pidyon. In the first paradigm, according to the first model, making a bracha is a matir. What gives us permission, what makes it accessible to us, is making the bracha is the matir. That the core purpose of the world is to make a bracha on it. So really, until you make the bracha, it doesn't belong to you. It's kachim, it's consecrated. It's otherworldly. What makes it part of this world? What makes it accessible to you? What makes it permissible for your use? Personal use? A bracha. Until the bracha, which is the matir, it's like kachim mamish. V'rak achar abracha mutu lehanus mea olam. L'fi adimion l'zirikas adam b'korben gam achar abracha shem hektish ala olam. Ela shem mutar azbana v'dom ha'achil ha'achil is kachim. According to the other paradigm, which says it's more similar to, to a kerem. So it means that it's still holy even after I make the bracha. It's now just something which is holy, which is permissible to benefit from. I'm sorry, it's only permissible. This is all within the first one. It's a matir. If you say that making a bracha is a matir, really it's kodshim. It's consecrated and dedicated to a higher order, to God. And what makes it permissible for personal use is making a bracha is a matir. The day shniya, according to the second metaphor, that compares it to a vineyard. Habrachi kepidyon kerem revoy. What grows in the fourth year on the, on the vine is wholly consecrated property until you redeem it. Klomar ba'ad ha'ana anu nosnim bracha. Uvezeh adav ha'anecha yotze l'chulen. When you redeem something, what are you doing? You're transferring. You are replacing. So when you make a bracha, what you're saying is, the bracha is payment for the hana, the benefit I'm about to get. So it's not that the two paradigms are, is the bracha a matir? It's a little bit of lumdus here. Is the bracha the matir? Is the bracha what makes something which is consecrated, makes it now, yotzeh l'chulen, it makes it now something which is permissible, attainable, accessible? Or is the bracha like pidyon? Am I redeeming it where it's still holy, but now I'm allowed to have it? According to the both opinions, the bracha is established that the world is a holy place. And everything in it, is truly otherworldly. It belongs to God. The only way we can access, access it and make it ours is through a bracha. So I pay in the supermarket, but I also have to pay in order to transfer its spiritual status. I transfer its legal ownership to Publix, to me, by paying at the cashier. And I transfer its spiritual ownership to being otherworldly and part of the holy realm, to being mundane and accessible to me, through a bracha. Bracha is the currency 
through which I pay and transfer the spiritual status. So if that's the case, says Ravolbe, saying a hundred brachas a day, what does that accomplish? The hundred brachas a day help bring us to a place, a recognition, an acknowledgement that we're living in a very holy world. If all the food in this world is holy until I make a bracha to make it mine, it means I should view the, whole, the world as a very holy place. I can't touch this world because it's so holy without first having permission from Hashem. So making brachos is the... Mitzvahs are kind of the general rule. Mitzvahs are how do I make... How am I raising my spiritual antenna to feel God's presence? How do I see the spirituality in an otherwise physical world? Through mitzvos. That's in a broad sense. But how do I, in a more even specific sense, see the spirituality in the most mundane? What is the most base thing we do? Like animals, we eat. We have to nourish ourselves in order to sustain ourselves to stay alive. We have to eat. It's a very base thing to do, to eat. It's a very base thing. In fact, sometimes people who want to achieve a level of holiness, they take on a fast. Because by abstaining from eating, they think they're really achieving a holiness. See, this has a different view. The real holiness is by elevating the act of eating, not by abstaining or refraining from it. So I'm living, basically what, what Revolb is saying is, by instituting a hundred brachas a day, it's instituting that a hundred times a day I look at this world and I see not just an animal, base, mundane, material, physical place, but I look at this world, I look up and down the aisles at the supermarket and I say, wow, look at this kedusha, look at this ruchnius, Look at the spirituality here. The fruit section, the vegetable section. Look at the meat section. Look at the beverages. Look how many salad dressing options. Look how many... Wow! Look at all the kedusha here. Other people see material, physical... Oh, i got to go shopping. It's the most mundane activity. I have my checklist. I have my shopping. This is the most mundane thing I do all day. Says Ravo no. Walk up and down those aisles and say, this is the holiest thing I'm going to do all day. Almost like being in shul. When I walk up and down these aisles and I see in every product, on every shelf, in every aisle of the whole supermarket, I see the Yad Hashem. I see the Kedusha. I see the holiness. And the bracha that I would recite on every one of those objects is reminding me that a hundred times a day, I'm seeing the holiness in what otherwise appears to be the mundane. So brachos then become the vehicle, the conduit, to see the spirituality within the material of this world. It's a whole different worldview on brachos. And when you live life in HD and high definition, where I don't see just mundane and physical and material, but I see the Yad Hashem, I see Hashem's holy hand in everything I'm doing, now you can imagine that if I do that a hundred times a day, by the end of that day, I'm going to have Yerah Shemai. If I see the spirituality in the mundane, I see Hashem's guiding hand a hundred times during the day, at the end of the day, I'm going to be different. It's not just my relationship with Hashem will be different. My entire world view, I as a result, will be entirely different. And Amir Hashem will pick up from here next time.